And what I want to do as for fun, for entertainment a little bit, but also to make us think, I want now to move us from 2008 to 2015, if you will bear with me. And I, I want to uh, have the conversation looking back at what actually happened. So we're going to, I'm going to present to you a little bit of a scenario, if you like. Some of it will be fun, but quite a lot of it is deadly serious. I don't necessarily believe everything that I'm going to say, but quite a lot of it I believe is fundamental to your future. Okay, so the first thing we learned when we look back, I've been looking back at the world map for 2013, 2012, and really, we realized the same thing. I think it was 210 that we began to understand that it's clusters of risks and it's clusters of opportunities and the relationship between them, which is of much more importance. Every single big innovation that has happened in the last five years happened as a result of an unusual connection between different dots on the map, between different parts of the radar screen, and it didn't happen in a single department or a single business or a single company. In fact, I can tell you, looking back over our three greatest triumphs, the three things that more than anything have built the new business of Nokia to where it is, they came out of new business partnerships between Nokia and Nokia and, and usually at least two other technology or innovation partners helped us to deliver what we needed. And I'm not just talking about the outsourcing of manufacturing. The other thing we realized, it's not just the blip on the screen, but it's how fast it's moving and in what direction and the size of it. And we all, uh, of course, have been uh, thinking a lot about wild cards, low probability but potentially high impact risks that come crashing into strategy. And I think one thing we've learned over the last three years is the days of having one Nokia strategy are over, they are history. Why? Because the world changes faster than we can get a board meeting together. So that is why we, we developed the multi-strategy uh, uh, multi policy back in 2010, which meant that we have one main bet, one main set of, uh, of, of beliefs about where we're going, but we also have been much more experimental and risk-taking around the edges of the business. And you know, uh, we could debate about what actually happened and the, the decisions that Putin took, the, uh, the posturing with, the, with Iran and uh, President Obama and so on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that our world uh, was profoundly disrupted, of course, by a mutant virus which swept uh, exactly as uh, the World Health Organization had predicted. It knocked out a lot of international travel. It helped all of our virtual products. We have always said that technology does more for the environment than you could ever possibly imagine. And of course, we were well placed to ride that boom that has followed ever since for the last three years in terms of, of virtual working teams, new, uh, new three-dimensional uh, 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 visual displays and the rest. But as I say, it's the combination of these things that has turned out to be critical. They present big opportunities far more often than you can imagine. And multiple low probability events can go off much more frequently than you think. So what it, requires, what it has required of us looking back is a much more innovative and dynamic way of decision making. And we've had to shorten the development of world map processes to four weeks. It used to take a year. Why? Because of course the world changes faster than we can do the process. When we look back, I mean, I, I'm astonished. I mean, I was back involved in IT back in 1978. And I remember uh, looking back to what we had then. We had a 32K. I had 32K of RAM to play with, and the systems were more reliable then than they are now. They were faster. I pressed one button, and ready came up. Basic was loaded. It was all in ROM. Uh, the word processing program uh, loaded almost instantly. In those days, it would cost, it would cost I mean, Google, of course, is now offering us 100 gigabytes each for free. But the fact is that if we were to have offered that capacity back then, it would have cost Google 750 million pounds, 1.5 billion dollars per person to provide that capacity. And we know that by 2020, we will have fuel cells that drive all of our products for at least 50 hours on a single charge, and yet people still want to go faster. And if you understand nothing about the future, nothing about my opinion of the future, please understand just one thing. The most important word of the future for Nokia, as we have seen over the last seven years, was not innovation. It was not being faster. It was not being a clever second follower. It was not uh, paying attention to our customers and all of those things. There was one, all of those things were important, of course. You had to do them as the basic foundation stones. No, my friends, we discovered 
that the route to success was one single word, and it's that single word that has been driving our share price, as you will know, over the last five years. It's that one single word, paying attention to that, that has added 25% more to our share value than any of our competitors, and that single word is, of course, emotion. It was understanding the passions that people have, why they get uh, excited, why they get annoyed, what is important to them, and why people want to come to work for us. And just one tiny example. You know we bet so much money in the... In the I'm so embarrassed now to think how much we have bet on 2003, 2008, 2010. We were still placing huge bets on people using video cameras on phones to communicate with their friends. Why did it fail? Of course people were using video, but not to communicate with their friends live. They weren't making any, any money for AT&T or Vodafone. They were using their video cameras, of course, to massage their brand and to promote themselves on Bebo, YouTube, Facebook, and, and anywhere else. Ma a tiny little edited clips, uh, uh, edited to perfection, uh, but edited nevertheless. But live video, live video between two points, zero. Why? Well, we had to learn that it's not a question of putting things in because we can do it. It's a question of understanding passions people have. And people have had and still have a huge emotional reaction to being interrupted in the middle of a meeting, or while they are semi-naked, by a video call. They have a huge reaction to having to hold something out like this when they are trying to do something else, or someone saying, have you got something to hide? Why didn't you show me yourself? And they have a huge reaction uh, to the invasion. Because, why? I told you, the human being can process only 112k per second by voice, which is about right but three terabits by vision, and vision is power. And in two seconds, I learn more about you from your background and what's behind you than in anything you could tell me in the next two hours. And that's a lot of data. And because that's quite revealing, people feel vulnerable. I also learned two seconds, in two seconds, whether you had a bad night last night, whether you shaved this morning, and whether you've brushed your hair and where you're about to go, because I can tell by the way you're dressed. And I can see who else is in the room behind you. My friends, we began to learn that video is one of the most emotional media in the world. And it's as we understand the passions people have, we find out ways to use these things. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, here's an example of it. Um, okay, it's my son at the age of eight. I'm persuaded him to do this thing. But actually, he really does not want to do this with her friends, his friends. He really, really does not. Especially because while he's making this video clip, his dad is telling him to tidy his bedroom and do his homework and suddenly hijacks the call. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> okay. So YouTube, yes. Live video, no. 2010 seems a long time ago. Obama, of course, won just by a hair's width, but didn't quite change America as much as we thought until one big event. And every one of us will remember where we were on 4th of June 2010, the day when a single bullet changed American history forever. The second bullet into a black American. The second bullet into a prominent black American. This is Martin Luther King all over again. A martyr, a hero, and someone who has already become a legend. And of course, the false rumor spread, we know all about it. The false rumor spread of the Ku Klux Klan involvement in that particular thing, and the FBI, FBI manhunt uh, man continued. <laughs> all kinds of things circulate on the internet, they're obviously not true, but they change the world. The future, my friends, is about emotion, and it's not fact, and it's not science. And emotion drove a very big campaign, which swept America within the first 24 hours of Obama's assassination. It wasn't long before we had one million Americans on the streets. Almost all of them were Afro-Caribbean and riots quickly followed. We had white supremacy groups out against them. The American military was called to put down riots in 14 cities simultaneously on a single night. This was America in flames. This was an America that we thought we would never see. This was an America that only uh, 18 months previously had elected the first black president. So my friends, this was the first time we began to see the power of SMS because it was those riots that were generated by SMS. It was those SMS that put one and a half million black Americans on the streets within 24 hours and told them where to assemble.
And it was SMS we saw only three weeks later uh, that swept through to Tiananmen Square, all kinds of protest movements, and it went right out across China. Why? Because people had seen the power of SMS. Now, it was already true in 2008. You see, this is the power. We think you're just making technology. No, you're not. You're shaping the world. We already knew in 2008, the previous year, there had been 70,000, 70, 70, 70,000 officially registered protests in China, which doesn't like to talk about these things, each of which was large enough to require a major response. 70,000 protests, big protests, in towns and cities, mainly about things like corruption and the seizure of land and other things like that. But what China was regularly doing at that point was turning off SMS. So what would happen is you use your phone, suddenly the signal's gone. Why? Because they're worried about a riot developing in a city. So the SMS would be taken out in that city. That, I mean, you knew that was happening through 2005, 2006, 2007. Why? Because your technology connects people. Your business is connecting people. And connecting people can be dangerous for government. So your technology has become right at the very heart of the transformation of society. Your technology is powerful enough to, to, to topple a government or to destroy 14 cities across America. Your technology is also powerful enough to answer some of the fundamental questions we face about things like resources and energy. And we all know that oil prices peaked and they fell, and we stabilized around $100 a barrel, which is about right for generating alternative energy. But global warming remains the number one concern in the world. You remember in 2005, there was not a single, you could hardly think of a head of government that was talking about global warming. But already by the time we did the world maps in 2007, you could hardly find a head of government that wasn't talking almost every week about global warming. What is this about, my friends? My friends, it was not about the science. The science had been there already. It was emotion. Yes, the science had become stronger, but there was still some debate, especially in America, about how solid the science was. They, what we learned, what Nokia decided in 210, was that the science was irrelevant. Yes, internally we might think the science is correct, but who cares? I'll tell you why. Science simply would, was going to tell us what would happen in 2050, 2050, 2060, 2070, and many of us would be dead by then. If you wanted to know what our business strategy should be, we came to the conclusion the future was not about science of global warming, it was about the emotions of global warming and what consumers were driving for, the passions people had about that science, the beliefs that people had, even if the science was wrong, the beliefs were so strong and so rapidly growing that we realized that by 212, most people in the world would be expecting companies like Nokia, not just to say our technology saves people travel, but the very way in which we conduct our business uh, is, is giving a good example in terms of environment. And that is why in 2010 uh, we, went, we, we decided to go carbon neutral. And let me explain what we meant by that, remind you. You remember in 28 there was a huge controversy about this. People saying, oh, well, you're just buying a way to pollute the earth. We said, no. Now, let's be clear. We've always been energy efficient and we want to be more so. And we will do everything that we can to show the world how to work. But when we've done that, we still have a certain amount of plastic we have to use and a certain amount of electricity that's used, not just in the making of stuff, but also in, uh, in things like charging our phones and the transmitters and the calls. And we've worked out the, we worked out the manufacturing footprint and also the lifetime footprint of a single phone. And uh, we worked out that even... Can anybody remember here how much it was? I mean, obviously with inflation it's more today and the carbon, carbon neutral price is different, but can you, can you remember how much it was in, uh, um, to offset a phone? I mean, it's, we, it's lost in the midst of time, of course, but let me tell you, let me just remind you. It was, um, it was about, um, let me think, I think it was, about, it was about a euro, a euro to offset all the energy use uh, from, the, from the very raw materials coming into a factory to finish product. I mean, it was just so little. I mean, in real terms today, it was only about half, you know, it's about two euros, uh, it, well, even less, but uh, not very much. In fact, we realized it was our moral duty to just absorb it. We cut a little bit of our operational costs and we said, we will go carbon neutral. It's a no-brainer for us. And what we did, we weren't just buying our permission to, to pollute. We, at the same time, started to invest in uh, wind farms in, in, in Finland, our home territory. Uh, we started to invest in new hydroelectric schemes. Again, in Finland, we found one or two places we could do it. Uh, we, we started to invest in, in other places where, for a small amount of money, we could help a community save a huge amount of the oil and gas and coal that they were using just for heat and light and things like that. And, we, and, 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 and through helping them to become carbon neutral, to, to, to become 
a carbon negative, actually they're not using carbon at all, um, that we were able to say, well, that is helping us to balance uh, the carbon we're using in our phones. And we went beyond that. And we decided, as you know, uh, it took us two years to do it, but we decided, uh, we actually did it by 212, uh, but we, we decided to go all the way. And we, we insisted, we said, you will not be allowed as a retailer to sell a phone unless you partner with us in making it carbon neutral. And we want you to contribute to it a little bit as well. We've made our manufacturing carbon neutral, so it's carbon neutral when it comes out of our warehouse. But we want you now to make it carbon neutral all the way through. And we will, we will work with you to do this. We, maybe we make a bit of contribution depending on the territory. But we want you to offset all the electricity use, all the, uh, the Vodafone transmitter currents used, everything absolutely everything. We want you to offset the cardboard packaging that you use. Uh, we want to offset the delivery charge for the phone, absolutely everything, for two years of phone use. And of course, uh, it, it added, um, I think it was a total of five euros per phone. And we won that. We know we won that. We, we, we proved that we won it in, in, in editorial coverage. We, you know that uh, a single page in, in one national paper in Germany is worth around 20,000 euros of coverage. Um, and uh, and you, we multiplied it up. We worked out that just simply in brand coverage, in the YouTube videos, in the in the in the online web communities, uh, on the radio, on TV, all this free stuff more than counterbalanced it. It add more than the very uh, more than that cost to our brand and our market share increased. The other thing we realised uh, back in 2009 was that uh, we were rapidly becoming primarily a company for emerging nations. Uh, one billion children became adults between 2000 and 2015. Uh, almost all of them will use a touch or touch a mobile phone by the time they're 30. We started to redraw the Nokia map. We put a complete ban on any map ex except population maps. Why? Because we wanted to focus attention on where people actually are and we're a completely global business. Most of our market, as you know, over the last four years, 75% of all sales have gone to people on incomes of less than $10 a day. Let me say that again. We've just analyzed the latest statistic. From 2010 to 2015, 75% of all new Nokia handsets and devices went to people on less than $10 a day. We had to completely re-engineer our own self-thinking about ourselves. We were no longer a business brand with ultimate you know, fancy products that we were in 1975, 1980, 81. We have become a product for the masses, a product for the ordinary men and women in the street, and these, of course, were our two biggest growth markets. The US was also already irrelevant to us, except for premium products, and too many others churning around stuff there, and Europe, well, that was also done. Um, cities, yes, they worked very well for us. The urbanization of society, the fact that 330 million people will have moved to cities by 2020, from, uh, that's from 20, 2008. That there are now 700, there will soon be 750 million Africans in cities. It was a genius thing for us. Why? Because it meant that a couple of areas on a couple of big hotels in even the most primitive city in the world, and they can have the best broadband you've ever seen working at 30, gigab uh, 30 megabits per second. So all of our products work for almost all people on the face of this earth without us having to worry about covering the rural areas. We've been able to do it in almost zero cost. Wonderful. And at the same time, we've seen the race to secure commodities and, and the rest. We know that uh, of, by 2013 already, two of the largest telcos were in China. But China, as you know, is hitting huge problems for one reason, or two actually. First is aging. China stopped having babies a very long time ago, uh, and so people are just getting older. People are living longer. We've got this population pushing up. We're now here at 2020, 2025. And you see this older population, but not so many babies here. Um, and uh, at the same time, we've seen inflation, and which is why we've moved all our manufacturing out of China. There's not a single Nokia handset today that's made in China. They're all made, as you know, in Cambodia, Vietnam, Pakistan, anywhere else. Some even back in Europe, in Germany. Yes, we started re-engineering in Germany again, uh, because actually they've turned out to be very effective at very rapid transformations of, our, of, of technology in a product cycle, which is now less than eight weeks. Now, when we think about places like Africa, and we think about all those handsets, I mean, we all know what was the killer application. What has been the killer application on all mobiles across Africa over the last eight years? <laughs> SMS, thank you very much. Absolutely, SMS. It was the case already in 25. Uh, we, have, we have 250 million businesses in Africa that rely on SMS. The average business is generating up to 50 SMSs a day. Uh, this is in a world where, uh, where SMS is instant, it builds community. Email, well, that was, that's history, really. 
Uh, email never really took off in Africa, um, and, it, and it's hardly used today. SMS is much more immediate, it's in your face, but it doesn't disturb people. You can do it while you're in meetings. Uh, you can do it with the most important thing about SMS is that you dip in and out of rural coverage. And you go to the top of a hill and you have coverage for eight seconds and then it disappears for the next two hours. It really doesn't matter. With SMS, it's perfect. You get received, click, receive. It's a perfect technology for an emerging economy. For us, who, are, who are, and bandwidth providers, it's a perfect technology because there's zero bandwidth involved. You can have 100 million people doing SMSs every 10 minutes. It really doesn't matter. Uh, for the price of a single video call in, in color, uh, it really, it's, it's nothing. Um, and, uh, and of course, it enables the bottom of the market to come in to these other, other value products. Um, and, uh, uh, what was, and of course, we had to learn from, these, from the cardboard phones, the world's first cardboard phones. Uh, you know that were one billion sold. We didn't think they would take off, but they did. Cardboard phones designed to be disposable. They melt in the rain. All you're left with is a tiny little strip of copper and a wire and a tiniest little battery. Cardboard phones that can never be recharged. The battery is built in and it's one stop and you throw. When the battery is one down, you've run out of air time. You can use it as long as you like, but when the battery's gone, it's finished. So there's no charging issue, there's no registration issue, anything else as well. And of course, we remember what happened, which is that once these phones hit Nairobi, once they hit the streets of Calcutta, they were re-engineered. People started peeling open these cardboard phones and connecting real batteries to the wires and they started hijacking themselves onto our networks and everybody else's. And so now we have at least 100 million cardboard phones that are in, uh, that are in plastic packaging that has been made in the back streets of Kolkata or Kenya or anywhere else, converted into permanent phones that can't be switched off because unfortunately when they were created, they were created without numbers. Uh, I can't get into the technicalities of it, but it, they just go on the network and they can make calls out, but they can't make calls back. So we can't stop these things. We can't lock them out. It's a big problem, but actually it's perhaps not particularly damaging to our market because it's happening at the bottom end. But I just want to make the point that while we can sit here in an ivory tower in Helsinki and plan products for the masses of those on less than $10 a day, and think somehow that they will take our products and just consume them. My friends, these are highly innovative people. Just because they're on low incomes, don't think that they don't know how to make things happen. And we will continue to find our products re-engineered and improved by those on low incomes for, in all kinds of creative ways. So, as I say, most Nokia sales will continue to be on those less than $10 a day. And we need to think of ourselves as, as basically playing to that market primarily. I know we're going to continue to make some profits out of the next generation communicators and all this kind of stuff. Yes, I know there are all kinds of exotic tricks in terms of turning clothes into mobiles and things like that. And we've done all kinds of things with my biometrics and I'm very excited about biometrics. I love the fact that my blood pressure is being monitored continuously while I'm here. My glucose is being recorded and sent to the hospital. I love the fact that I can see a readout of my body temperature on my, on, on, on my phone, um, that, that I can see how hydrated I am. And there's a whole kind of other things. It's fun. But at the end of the day, really Really and truly, we have to face the bottom line. It's just a gimmick. It doesn't actually improve people's lives in terms of health, um, health uh, survival. Uh, but yes, it's a nice little add-on. Uh, but really, and, and this was too. This was another nice gimmick. You know, the hand in your phone that lasted a little while. Uh, there's just the, you know the cell phone thing that sticks for 24 hours and you throw it away, um, and the, this kind of stuff. Yes, I know people had lots of fun, but the fact of the matter is they're using these things for other reasons than we thought, and will continue to do so. Now. I want to come back to one of the other big, big takes I think we had. It came out in the world map of 2006, it was there. 2007, it was there. 2008, it was big time there. 2009, it was done. We decided to write the word convergence out of our vocabulary. Nokia made a decision that convergence was a curse. Why? Because convergence is a guarantee that everything looks the same. Have you, I mean, I mean if you look at it, it's, it's extraordinary how, have you looked out in Helsinki today? All the cars look the same. I cannot tell. Can you tell a BMW from a Fiat these days? I certainly can't. I could in 2010, I can't in 2015. Why? Because they're perfectly converged. Because every car manufacturer decided to converge on price and quality, and they've driven themselves out of existence. One went to, uh, to hybrid fuel cells, so did everybody else. One went to electric vehicle uh, uh, running on hydrogen, so did everybody else. One decided to go uh, with, um, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with special new nanotechnology coatings on windscreens uh, so th and, and wheels and everything else, so the car would never be washing again. And so did everybody else. And how clever is that? Not very clever at all. We began to realize that our only competitive advantage, unless we're just going to drive on price, and by the way, how can we chase on price to the bottom, and since when was Nokia supposed to be at the bottom of the market on price? 
we came to the conclusion that the only way we were going to survive was a divergent strategy. And divergence was the word. Convergence, anybody who used that word, was sacked. <laughs> divergence was the key, because all innovation is divergent. By definition, it's doing it different, doing it better to serve someone's needs. So we began to do an aggressive focus on unmet needs and places where there needed to be urgent divergence in order to meet them. Um, and uh, we got to some strange places. At least our competitors did. They followed us into some very, very strange devices, but never mind. But I'm talking about real divergence. I'm talking about divergence that does things beautifully. And the fact of the matter is that divergence also helped us to understand that it's all very well to pack more and more facilities into the same device. But most of us in 25 were still hardly using it. Put your hands up if you are using more than 30% of the potential of the device you have in your pocket. Put your hands up. Okay, well, you're unusual, but most of you are not. <laughs> most of you don't even know what half those buttons are for. Why? Because life's too short. Life is too short, my friends. Why would you bother to waste time to do it? And, and by 2015, what has actually happened, the actual, what has actually happened is, we have hundreds of convergent devices. I have 15 devices in my home and three on me at the moment that can take pictures, still pictures and videos. But the fact is that almost all the pictures I take are taken with a device that's in my bag. So, the, the, uh, so convergence means we have to recognize there are multiple devices. And anyway, who wants one of these things? I mean, who's, I mean 2015, who here has got a web-enabled fridge with a... With a you know, I, mean, but, I mean, you have. Well, do you use it? No. You do. Listen, I had a web-enabled fridge in 1999. It was as useless then as it is today. Why? Because it was intelligent. You clicked and you threw. As soon as you took something out, another one came within 24 hours in a plastic bag delivered to my door automatically. How clever is that? <laughs> Listen, I work at home in this virtual world. The only time I go out is for entertainment. I go shopping to get entertained. I don't want more product coming to my house. And actually, do I always want the same amount of the same smoothie coming in? Life's too boring for that. So, you know, there are other places to do that. And, you know, okay. Yes, yes, yes. You know, these things were, are available in the shops for, for, for one dollar. They give them away with the newspapers every day. But I don't know any of my friends that are using them. Uh, okay. Confession time. <laughs> Put your hands up if you have more than one remote in your living room. Listen, you are the most technologically competent people in the world. Why have you not learned how to program this device? I'll tell you why. Because there's some emotional, deep emotional connection to the history of these things. Ah, oh, I remember this one when we bought it. <laughs> because it's complicated. That's right. It's complicated. The fact of the matter is that simplicity and speed are everything. And let me just say again, this is a take-home message. We can be very clever, too clever, with our convergence or our divergence, or speculating about this. Our world maps, when I look back, were full of cleverness. It was a big disaster area and took us into huge, huge innovation errors. Because one of the things we had to go back to do was to fix fundamental problems that we'd failed to fix in 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the world maps had not picked them up. And one of the things was recognize the difference between being clever and being real. And that's why we changed focus. We changed focus, as you know, from engineering then we said we were an internet company, then we said we were like an internet company. And then we realized, actually, we're a passion company. We're about connecting people. And why do you connect? Because people want to be connected. Now, I just want to come back to marketing because it's got more complicated. <laughs> In the web world, we had to recognize that marketing was dead. Let me just explain. Our service repeatedly showed by 2008 and 9 that the average person trusted the opinion of a stranger more than our CEO. And that was really worrying. They also trusted the opinion of a stranger more than the opinion of the Prime Minister, more than the head of our medical services department when he said there was no risk of bird flu in Finland and so on. And when the, uh, more than the government when they said don't worry about the latest papers showing electromagnetic radiation can predict uh, that, that, that you can, doctors can predict which side of your head you get brain cancer depending on where you hold your phone. And when our own medical director came on, on, on TV, he was not believed. To say, yes, we've looked at the research, we believe the risk is very, very low. 
When the government's health officers came on the phone, on, on, on the TV, and said, we have looked at it, the government surveys suggest that the risk is 0.0000001% or whatever. It is, to all intents and purposes, a safe product to use. He was not believed. But when some individual put a video on YouTube showing four phones pointed at some unpopped popcorn, <laughs> has anybody seen that? Remember that video? Some, uh, and they turned and they started ringing these phones, these four phones, and the popcorn went bump, 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 bump. Even though it was a joke, it was believed. And people, even when other rumors went around and said, it is a joke, it's crazy, it's nonsense, and almost all the comments were saying, it's nonsense, it's nonsense, it's nonsense. Guess who the public thought put those it's a nonsense notices there? They thought that you did. They thought that it was you, it was your sons, your daughters, your friends and your colleagues who had been rung up and said, for goodness sake, go and put some comments on because this science is damaging us. Put some comments on saying it's nonsense. So the rumours persisted. And one thing we began to learn is this, that marketing is dead in the online world. Marketing will never work again in the way that we thought. And we have to find an alternative. Let me, let me prove it to you. If you go to a hotel in Singapore, and, you're, um, and you book yourself in, or someone has booked you in, and you, s you type in the name of the hotel, and of course TripAdvisor comes up higher than the hotel because it has more links to it because of the web community. Okay? And on the right-hand side, the hotel is hitting back with an official paid ad. <laughs> Which do you click on first? You have three choices, my friends, and you have one second to decide. You can go for the official paid ad, the official truth about the hotel as given to you by the owners. <coughs> Or you can go to the wonderful encouraging comment from someone who had an amazing time, or you can go to the story about the rats, food poisoning, and other problems. Put your hands up if you go first to the official site to find out the truth about your hotel. None. Put your hands up if you go first to the good news to cheer yourself up. 4%, 5%. Put your hands up and you go straight to the rats. <laughs> what we learn is this, and it's really important, laughter aside, this is a fundamental fact. What you have told me is that inside Nokia, if you are representative of your world, that advertising is dead. What you've told me, the Hilton can spend one billion dollars a year advertising in your newspapers, yes people are still reading them, on radio, TV, or by word of mouth. You know what happens? When, what is your name? Awesome. Ossie. When Ossie wants to... He can't remember the address of the Hilton Hotel. Nobody types in web addresses. He types Hilton into Google. And the moment he does, he hits a problem. Or Hilton does. Because, of course, he sees rats. So the more Hilton advertises, the more the world learns about rats. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The only way that Hilton can defend its reputation is to sort these comments out. But there's another problem. There's another problem. Guess who wrote the story about the rats? Competition. Competitor! Thank you very much. But you still went there first. Even though you knew that. Isn't that strange? <laughs> My friends, I told you, the future is not about being logical. The future is about emotion. And what you've shown me is that the mo emotion and passion in that comment, even though you knew in your heart it had been written by a competitor, pulled you as an irresistible force and destroyed the brand of the, of the hotel chain. Now the good news is, uh, by the way, who wrote the nice comment? Member of the Hilton, thank you. <laughs> Actually, it's an issue, and one of the biggest challenges in Web2 is verification that people are who they are, which is why commenters are now being ranked, Every person who gives any comment on anything is being ranked and assessed themselves. Um, and quite right too. So, uh, because if it's discovered that you're regularly putting up reviews which are very different from everyone else, you will be banned and, uh, and, 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 and blacklisted, not just across YouTube, but across every other social networking platform in the world. If they find any connection with you, they'll lock you out. Um, which is good. And you won't get a job anywhere else either, because when, <laughs> because when they type your name into Google to find out who you are, they'll see that you are a fraud. I'm glad about this. It, it took them until 2013 to sort it out, but it's been quite successful. But the point I'm making is this. If, if 
as we have done. We re-engineer ourselves, which we did. If we stop talking about bits and bytes and, and innovations and cramming more facilities in and start focusing on the customer and their needs, if we can connect with the passions people have, and we did, and if we get them so excited that they are filling every single platform with comments and praise and adoration of our brand, then of course market share goes up. And, and we have actually, as you know, we reduced our branding, uh, reduced our spending on marketing by 85% last year because we finally decided that advertising was dead. Okay, so now, uh, of course one other thing that happened with Web2, so many people doing this stuff, uh, we've found that the world is going completely crazy on text, much more so than we ever realized, and iPhone was completely thrown out of joint. Uh, w uh, by, by 2010, iPhone had had to completely re-engineer every product to have a pull-out keyboard. We could have told them that. We knew that from the, the Nokia communicator. But, but key entry is very important. And the other thing is um, uh, uh, cloud computing, having, uh, and it became a part of our standard package, to have absolute world-class, the best speech recognition systems in the world, not built into the phone, that's so last century, we can't compete, but actually built into the cloud. So basically, it's a reverse streaming. We, when we first were selling video streaming and things like that, we thought we were streaming to the cloud. No, 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 no. We're streaming sound and actually lip movements as well for added, added uh, recognition. It gives an extra 5% if people want to do it like that, but they can do it just with speech if they wish. We are streaming sound to our processes. We have, the, we have bought, we have partnered, I told you it was all about partnerships. We bought out Dragon, which was the best speech recognition system in the world. Dragon, we have Dragon speech recognition capability on every one of our phones and nobody else in the world does. And it's all free, it's built into the contract. Um, and so it's a question of getting this data in was very important. And of course, we were all wrong-footed by iPhone. We, let's, 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 let's face the facts. iPhone was a fantastic success. And from that moment on, we knew that we had to go one better. And we decided to copy every single element, the lovely things, the way that the menus move around, the, the velocity issues. Every single uh, iPhone tried to kill us. They prosecuted us. They took us to court five times, every single time they lost. Why? Because actually we were able to show that in our own laboratories, for years previously we'd been working on stuff like that. It's just that we'd never, why hadn't we done it? We never actually got it out. Right? But we had patents on it. We had the technology there. And so we were able to blast them at their own game. And what we did, we made no shame about it. We said, okay, they want to hit on that. We'll look at that. And we've been doing it longer than them, but we were slower. So we, we, we created iPhone lookalikes, and the, and the secret of it was no more buttons. And that got us out of another fix, which is we want customization of one, which is the other big theme. Every phone is different. Every single phone is unique, and you make your own device. Um, and it got us around another hassles as well. So we went better. We went simpler. We went more reliable. Uh, we did much better things with integration, um, and, but we added the keyboard in. <laughs> we know about keyboards. And we added speech recognition in because we know about reality checks. And we know that it's no longer enough to have a product, technology product, without these innovation partnerships. And we added other things too, which I'll come to, which is, the, as you know, the biggest earner of all. And the reason we've been able to give away every device free. We, uh, from next year, we will not be charging the world for any Nokia device. That's a new announcement I'm making today. You knew it was coming, you didn't know the date, and I'll tell you how we're doing it. Um, by the way, it got us around the other problem, the aging population. You know in Europe that, uh, that uh, we will have one million people in Italy in 10 years' time, 2025. In 10 years' time, there will be one million people in Italy over the age of 90. One million. They are a new niche market for our products. Nobody is properly addressing it. They just laugh about old people. I tell you this, for an older person, a mobile phone is a lifeline. And that's where the biometrics really does help. Uh, and the older person, uh, we, want, we want devices that can sense movement. Devices that report no movement for 12 hours. Uh, devices that can detect body heat. Devices that will listen to ambient noise, just noise in the room. And can respond to a shout. So, and how can we do it? We don't have to re-engineer anything because, of course, having gone down the, the, the decision to make no buttons, we were able to completely re-engineer re that interface in software. And we're able to completely re-engineer new products and services which we can download and they can be released for 10 minutes. They're all available for free. And what's more, we've, we've made it open source so anyone else can re-engineer our phones. Um, and, uh, and, and we now have, we think, 85% of the market in those over the age of 75 because our products are easier to use they have specially designed interfaces, they have very, very large print, 
um, and and, uh, and 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 they are just perfect for this age group. Now, I just want to come back to um, issue of uh, consolidation. We know that there's only 10, 10 telcos in the world. We think by twenty twenty, um, and I want to talk about the Venugal partnership. You know all about it. Uh, we've seen our share price increase by forty five percent over the last two years as a direct result. I would just want to go back a little bit of the history um, and and uh, and 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 take us to the announcement of why it is and how it is that we're going to make all our products free. Uh, as you know, there was great debate. I mean, it was on all our world maps. It's so sickening. I look back on the world maps of 2008. It was all there. But we were too slow. We jolly nearly lost it. But because in, two th in January 2009, aggressive decisions were made, we, we recaptured the initiative. You remember that in 2008, Barclay Card had already decided to do a big deal with Vodafone. And they'd started to... Well, Barclay Card had already... Um, decided to, to have touchless computing. So no more chip and pin. It's basically remote stuff. You go close. It's just using the same RFID. You just go close to pay. That's all. But what Barclay Car was missing was the biometrics, which we had in our phones. They were missing uh, the fact that you still needed a pin number, which you don't need if you've got biometrics. And along comes our products, just in time. Um, and uh, we started to talk not with Barclay Card, but we started to talk with American Express because we wanted a global organization that's a financial services organization that would not be seen as, 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 a, as, a, as a bank. Barclay Card was too much tied up with Barclays uh, and Visa as well. We, 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 want, we, wanted, we wanted a different kind of product that's global, thoroughly embedded into banking, but is not a bank. American Express was the ideal partner, and we did a tie-up with American Express. We also, and and I'm, pl I'm proud to say that we took the initiative on this although we turned out to be one of the smaller players in some respects. We also then tied in Vodafone. We could have gone with AT&T, but actually it was the European market that seemed most innovative, and we could see where Vodafone was going to go. And Vodafone, quite, hungry, quite frankly, were hungry for a big new idea. And they were under pressure in their own share price. So Vodafone came in, um, American Express came in, we came in with the real guts. We came in with the, with the software, the proprietary standards, which allowed a secure credit card transaction to happen in a beautifully iPhone-type simple way. All you had to do was put a thumbprint on your phone when you were ready to pay for something. If you put a thumbprint on the phone in a restaurant, it automatically sends a signal to the restaurant saying, send me the bill. The bill then arrives into the phone, and you press, and, and, and then you press, and you, then you press the, um, uh, you, th then you press the, the, uh, the accept, the pay button to pay, and it's done. And we've been, we are now routinely clocking up transactions of up to 25,000 euros a time using this technology. Uh, we know it's sec more secure than chip and pin for obvious reasons. And uh, we have not had a single fraud yet on our system. It's ultra encrypted. It's absolutely beautiful. It works at incredible speed. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, it's just marvellous. And we did it, of course, with Google. Why? Because they're sexy, they're beautiful, and they're always innovative, and they were built in their Google browsers and everything else as well. It just made a fantastic partnership. And just le let's, let's just remind ourselves of the numbers here. Our aim was very simple, to capture all, every single retail card, credit card, and cash card transaction that's going on in people's pockets and those that have our products. The deal is this. If they will, if they will reduce by 85% all the payments on their cards, they can keep a card if they wish, but we, we, will regi they, we, 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 we measure it. If they record by 85% all the volume through their cards, then they get free products. They get free, uh, you know the deal, you get the free any, any, any model you want. You get unlimited broadband at home down your landline. You get satellite or cable TV unlimited channels. You get um, unlimited video calls. Oh, and the, co the cost of providing these things, of course, is falling towards zero every day. It's all money in our back pocket. But the revenues are stunning. You see, even back in 2010, the tr credit transactions were running in the UK alone at 700 billion a year. Credit card debt was 55 billion, and the average credit card interest rate was 18 <laughs> percent, um, and 2 percent commissions, which is what we knew we could get, because the, uh, the usual is 3.5, so we split it. 2, 2 percent for the Venugo, 1.5 for the, for, the, for the rest, and they were worth 14 billion a year. And that was just the start, because of course, uh, uh, and by the way, we knew that the cost of providing these free services was falling exponentially. We knew that. Uh, we knew that the revenues from financial services would rise dramatically, uh, and there would be a point at which we would start to break even. And that point, we think, is 215. Actually, it's next year, and that's when we're doing it. Um, now, what are, we, what are we capturing? We started by thinking credit card transactions, but of course, it didn't stop there. We're now running people's credit, uh, current accounts because we're capturing 
their PAYE. People are actually loading their, their salaries onto their phones. I know it's basically the phone is a bank account. The Vodafone bill is a bank account. Um, so they're getting their income on it. They're paying people using it. Um, delayed accounts, forget credit cards. Credit cards is not even a word we would use anymore and anybody gets sacked for using the word credit cards. Basically, we're talking about delayed payment systems where you have free interest, in, interest free period for the first, uh, first whatever it is, days. After that, we sting them for about 18%. Um, we have pre-approved loans. That is where, that is where it's a bulk. You could, you've got $25,000 pre-approved to go and buy a car and you can do it anytime. And we set those things up, they're part of the account. And these, my friends, are very, very profitable. We have, a, we have 45 billion pounds in the UK alone on pre-approved loans right now. Uh, rising by five million pounds a month. Uh, we, we offer insurance. It's one click for insurance. Yes, no. And the insurance deal is always the same. It's extra one percent on the product you buy. Yes, no. Yes, it's pure profit for us. Um, we've got international transfers. Three to four, three to four percent of all the wealth of developing countries, where, as you know, most of our sales are now, is happening. Uh, is, is is movement of money from one country to another. And we're capturing, we hope, we hope to capture 40 to 50% of all of that traffic without any foreign exchange transactions whatsoever. We're eBay and web compliant, and the most important thing is we own the customer. We can sell them anything, and we know everything about them, because we've got every transaction they're doing, we know, we, we know, we know the colour of the toilet paper they use, we know absolutely everything about them, and our database is the most important asset that we have. So we've ceased to be a phone company, We've become a financial services company that provides data devices for free as a means of getting people into financial services. It's the most lucrative partnership we've ever had, and it was a dream, and thank God we just managed to scrape in in time in 2009. At the same time, we've upped the resolution of all these other things. You know, we have, we've gone into all kinds of fantastical places like digital control and connecting people. We've said connecting brains and chip brains and uh, control by thought. Yes, we've done all these kinds of things, and quite honestly, they're nice things for generating media coverage and TV programs, but they don't sell. Uh, text to brain, yeah, we have crude versions of it and we will have them by 2020, but again, they're not big products. Big products are financial services, it's connecting people in traditional ways, and the rest. And I just want to finish with one final thought. I said the future is about emotion, and it's the emotion of our customers and our workers that matters. And I just want to go back to 2008, that world map. You see, what was missing from it well, it was there, but actually with hindsight, I think it could have been stronger, was the reality check. The fact that actually people do not want robot services anymore. Put your hands up if you get really angry when someone says, you get through to a utility company, says press one for accounts, press two for this, press three for that. <laughs> My friends, I thought we were supposed to be in friends of our customers. What you've told me is that you want to wring the neck and shoot in the head anyone that designs and builds such a system, correct? But we use these systems. In fact, we were using them until 2011 when we decided to ban them completely. I'm just saying that's a reality check. How is it, how could it possibly be that we as an IT company could possibly build into our strategy methods of doing things which drive us crazy when anybody else dares to do it to us? Institutional blindness. It's because we've been inside Nokia too long. And what we began to realize is we had to get back to the customer and the reality check. And it's a bit like the remote devices and all the rest of it. And the client actually does not want a robot. So we decided to put in proper customer relationship management systems. And the deal is this. Stop using landlines and we can treat you well. If you use a landline, don't blame us if we want to buy a robot. All landline calls go to robots. Why? Because we don't know who you are. Landlines are switchboard numbers. They're anonymous, so we don't waste our time. But if you have the courtesy to use our device to call, then we know who you are because we've got the ID in there and we will treat you personally, because we know who you are, we know who bought the phone, and we probably say, is this Patrick Dixon? Hi, is that Patrick Dixon I'm speaking to, or is it someone else in the house? <laughs> okay, yeah, I know who you are, how can I help you today? And straight away we've got a personal relationship, and the next time the call comes back, it will automatically be rooted to the very individual you last spoke to, or the person sitting next to them, and up will flash the entire record. And we've completely integrated every single part of knowledge, so that, our, so that the current account information comes up as, as the same way as the information about the problems you had out, uh, synchronizing Outlook and the phone, okay? It's a completely integrated relationship because we own the customer, the whole customer. Um, and so, uh, the second thing we realized was techno fatigue. Quite frankly, people get bored about whether there's 48 megabits uh, camera or a 51 megabits camera. 
I mean, there comes a point where basically it's good enough, and that was worrying. And we reached that point in 211, when people basically had what they basically needed. And we had bandwidth, we had a battery that was great, the processor was fine, the memory could be a bit faster and, and, and all the rest. But basically we realised we could no longer build our entire reputation about just adding numbers to numbers for people who aren't techno geeks. Um, and then there was a final challenge, and I'll just finish with this. It remains our biggest headache. I wish we sold it, um, but we haven't. Um, let me just take you back to the heady days of 2008, if you can remember back then. Put your hands up if you are regularly having problems getting Outlook to synchronize with your mobile device. I bought the first one in 1996. I had a, a deal. Every single time there's a model out, I'll buy two of them, and I don't care if I have to upgrade twice in every eight weeks, because I love it, and I still do. But you know what? I had to abandon the product. Why? Well, it was when I'd spent probably no less, and I'm not exaggerating, 25 hours on call centers. Every time, what would happen is I would get more and more escalated to a point where, basically, the, the director of that team would phone me back and say, I'm sorry, we can't help you with your problem. I thought it was just me. I thought I was just a techno, techno idiot. And then I began, it only recently dawned on me that the problem was he was trying it himself and he couldn't make it work on his own phone either. And so what would happen is I'd say, oh, well, never mind. I still love the communicator. I'll carry on using it. And I hope by the next product it will be better. And that carried on for six years, seven years, eight years. And after the eighth year, my friends, I finally, the emotional connection with the brand disappeared. And I walked away. Now, I think it's a major scandal at this day. And the reason why is because no one else is work either. <laughs> Walked straight in with a breezy face, says, hi, good morning, hope you slept well. He said, well, I was going to bring one or two bits with me, but my technology let me down. I had a technological incident last night, and I thought, oh, well, call it a day. I said, the trouble is, you're still smiling. I wish that you were hopping mad with righteous indignation. I wish that you were ready to wring the neck of the person who sold you that stuff. The fact is that you're smiling because actually you say, well, that's life. All these computers. Yeah, I mean, what can you expect? It's only a computer. I say, hey, 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 hey. Since when have we said that? My friends, if, if you're going to get one thing right for the next five years, from I'm now back in the present, from 28 <laughs> on, I would say this. Let's make it work. Let's deliver on the promise. Let's make it a moral issue. It fuses any longer to sell things where it says one thing on the outside of the box and it does a different thing inside the box. If, quite frankly, you cannot make your products work with Outlook, stop selling it as Outlook compatible, period. It's a moral issue for sorting out the old problems so our stuff actually does what it says on the packet. And when it does, do you know what's going to happen? The calls to our call centers are going to fall towards zero. So our aim is to get call centers to zero and improve our brand 1,000%. And if we can do it, we'll be the only people in the world that do. And we will gain market share. And I'm not saying don't innovate. I'm saying just show me how we can innovate and sort at the same time. And if you can say, Patrick, I guarantee a Symbian operating system will work beautifully by March, I say, fine, innovate. Now, I, I, I'm sorry to put it so strongly, but actually, it is, it will, it could be your major differentiator of the future. I, I do think this is a major opportunity. And with that, really, I think I finished. So we launched the 100% program in 2012, which is 100% hardware reliability. That was our number one promise. So we gave a two year guarantee. We either believe it or we don't. And we went twice as far as our competitors. 100% software reliability. Our promise to you is, I don't know, we give you a, a money back every time you have to call a call center if it's our software that's bugged. 100% security with remote backup with bandwidth. What we said was, we build into the contract with our suppliers that all your data on your phone is backed up every day. Period. That's it. You forget about it. And as soon as you log in with a new phone number or you move your SIM, everything comes back down to the, a new phone. 100% personal, no robots, that's our guarantee. If you call on our, one of our products, you'll never speak to a robot again. 100% flexible, uh, yes we have a keypad which you can pull out on all of our high density text based products, but for all the others the interface is entirely screen based, no buttons, which means that you completely customise it yourself. 100% integrated and we guarantee it works. Um, it's 100% global power, which means we provide the best speech recognition systems in the world. We give you cloud computing on every small device. So you're no longer limited to the speed of your processor, and it's 100% free. How about that? 
and you know that it generates a huge media coverage. It took 24 months to achieve even 80% of our aims, but it increased our market share by 15% in 24 months. But the most exciting thing is we did it and we increased our prices at the same time. On every single level, we were able to compete on price. No, look, we didn't compete on price. We competed on actually delivering what we promised. And the price pressures eased, our profits are up 20%, and we've become the industry standard. We have become the global standard. And our slogan, our slogan, of course, as you know, is no longer connecting people, because that's more, we're more than connecting. We're connecting with passions that people have in order to make their lives better. And making people's lives better is what drove us to that 100% reliability standard. Making people's lives better is what drove us to simplicity rather than yet more techno innovation. Making people's lives better made us put customers and their passions and the emotions they have right at the very heart. Making people's lives better took us into, into neutrality when it came to global warming. And we, I believe, are in a changing world we have the opportunities to help transform our society. We, our technologies are driving 100 million businesses in the poorest parts of the world. Our technologies are helping to save the environment by providing new tools for virtual working. Our technologies are connecting people to do the things that really matter to them at the times they really need to. And I hope that we will continue our success. Thank you very much.